What is gatekeeping? It's a question that's come up a lot in the YouTube comment section recently because we're doing a big event on the ethics of gatekeeping. And basically it's a term which isn't specifically a legal term, so it's kind of a more colloquial term. The LGO does reference it, so in the report in 2011 it did on gatekeeping effectively, it was called something else, it was called about ensuring justice for people who are homeless or something like that. I'll put a link to it in the, uh, in the comment section. Basically, it refers to this term and it basically says that uh, other organisations have coined the phrase gatekeeping to describe where councils refuse to accept a homeless application or to provide interim accommodation where there is no legitimate reason. So there's two things it's really specifically talking about in the narrow sense and it all hinges on sections 184 and sections 188 of the Housing Act 1996 which obviously sounds like a lot of jargon but really they're the only two sections you really need to know about if you're doing this kind of work, if you're trying to get people housed. And section 184 is the gateway into housing assistance under the Housing Act. So basically, if you approach any department of a local authority and you give them reason to believe that you might be threatened with homelessness or you might actually be homeless and you ask the council for help, you will immediately trigger section 184 of the Housing Act 1996. So that is what's called making a homeless application. It's not when the council invites you back two weeks later to go to an interview, it's already happened. And when I say council, I mean housing authority. So a social service authority would not be under that duty, but a housing authority would be. So you might have a district council in an area or you might have a unitary authority, both of which would be the ones you want to go to. So it just depends on your, your local kind of council makeup. Now section 188 is a little bit further than that. So if there's reason to believe that you might be homeless, might be eligible for assistance, which loosely means having recourse to public funds, and you might have a priority need, the local authority shall secure accommodation for you, which we call it interim accommodation or emergency accommodation or temporary accommodation. But those are the two duties that this concerns with. So as I say, these are gates ways into the assistance that the Housing Act is going to owe you. And so starting with section 184, basically the code of guidance is also clear as I say, you can approach any department of the local authority and you can do it any way you want. You don't need to use a specified form. The code of guidance also talks about a really important thing which I'll refer to later on but I'll set it out now. Within the Housing Act there's part 6 on the one hand and there's part 7 on the other. Now part 6 is basically the, the legal duties that councils have to follow in order to allocate social housing. Um, so, you know, you call it the housing register, housing allocation policy, whatever you want to call it, it'll be called something different in your area, choice-based lettings, whatever it is. That's all under part six, and anyone can apply to any council, but they've got quite strict criteria on who's going to be eligible for those, or to, eligible to get onto that housing register and get housed. Part seven is concerned with anyone who might be homeless or threatened with homelessness. So, lots of people will go down part six, and in the course of filling in that form, on often on the council's website, they will give the council reason to believe that they may be homeless or threatened with homelessness. What that means is council should immediately treat that part six application as a part seven application because obviously under part six you could wait 10 years to get housed, whereas under part seven you should get emergency accommodation immediately if you satisfy those three criteria in section 188. So that's the kind of the big layout. Now there are 10, something like 10, I'm going to go through roughly 10 different ways that councils use uh, law incorrectly or they deliberately just mislead people so that they can avoid those duties. So as I say, section 184, section 188 are gateways into assistance. Gatekeeping is simply where you, they just sat on the gate and they're not letting people in. That's, that's kind of where the word comes from. So that's the kind of overview. And as I say, I'm going to try and go through various different ways the councils do it. Some are really obvious and some are actually quite subtle um, and arguably affect more people. So um, you have to kind of yeah pay attention to the small print, unfortunately. It's just a bit complicated, but that's the way it is. So number one is local connection. So you'll often hear councils say to people, you have no local connection here, you need to go back to your home area. Now, if you look at section 184 and section 188 of the Housing Act, it doesn't mention local connection at all. So you can apply to any council you want to in the country, and this is particularly relevant where you're fleeing abuse or, or one area is particularly unsafe for you or something like that, but you can approach any area. That's the way the law is written because the law is set out to catch people who might fall through the cracks. That's why it's kind of done like that. So local connection, you know, give it, to give an example, uh, in my case work in Bedford, uh, I worked with a lady who was subject to very, very high level domestic abuse by a perpetrator who had been known to break into the refuges she's been staying in and stuff like that. So really kind of well known to police, really, um, really kind of nasty guy basically and she came to Bedford because it was you know safe as anywhere um, and so I went into the council with her and the housing options officer we, we basically emailed beforehand and said look this is the situation we're making a homeless application we're going to come down to see you and the first question the housing officer said was why are you come to Bedford you know why are you not going somewhere else so we explained the, uh, the answer to that which was it's unsafe to go where where she'd fled from 
and Bedford was as good a place as any. She had a kind of some distant kind of support network and stuff here. And so um, immediately the kind of local connection was engaged. She was trying to say, you have no local connection here, you need to go somewhere else. And the way that interview followed, I had to actually literally, I literally asked the housing off officer to stop scowling at my client because the way she was so rude, so kind of so abrupt and just, yeah, as I say, well beyond the kind of, like kind of bandwidth of what's reasonable for a professional to do. And yeah, anyway, push come to shove it we got we got it sorted she got housed uh, shortly afterwards in social housing so that's kind of an example of how local connections used on a similar note number two intentional homelessness so again section 184 and section 18 do not mention intentional homelessness at all and there are various duties to people who are definitely intentionally homeless even if they actually are and most people who are told they are actually not so that's another kind of story to give an example of this um one of the first lgo cases i ever read back 10 years ago when i was kind of getting my head around all this stuff within the law was a guy who had been evicted from council housing by a council so they knew full well why he'd been evicted they'd been through the courts they had a lot of information to show that in their opinion he was intentionally homeless he made a homeless application the day after or on the day he was uh, he was evicted and the council said you're intentionally homeless we've got no duty to you off you go and he complained to the LGO and he got something like two grand worth of compensation for it so as I say intentional homelessness is not a reason to not accept a homeless application uh, or place someone in interim accommodation uh, and as I say even if you are intentionally homeless and you're in priority need the council still have to house you for a period of time that gives you a reasonable opportunity to find something else so again it's pretty standard and the amount of myths and kind of prejudices that some housing officers have about people choosing to be homeless I mean we saw in the news this week with Suella Braverman saying that people yes yeah, lifestyle choice that people living in tents that kind of attitude permeates the uh, the homelessness sector unfortunately and so that's why a lot of these housing officers don't have any sympathy for people in, in many situations when when really legally they they don't have a choice really they just have to or they what they should be doing is applying the law so that's intentional and just to give you a kind of another example from my own casework uh, again a few years ago again a victim of domestic abuse um she'd gone into the council on her own told the council about the abuse that she was experiencing and the council officer recorded in her notes to say uh client is suffering considerable domestic abuse I've advised her that if she were to leave her property she would become intentionally homeless now that's nonsense obviously you're not intentionally homeless if you give up accommodation because you're being abused there but that's the kind of situation that's what she'd been kind of that's the hand she'd been dealt so we went back and get sorted out and it was a really easy compensation payment in that sense because it was in the record you know the, the advice was ridiculous and had been recorded often this kind of stuff is you know often housing officers aren't stupid enough to record themselves breaking the law but sometimes it does happen so that's the kind of that's the kind of way intentional homelessness can can kick in thirdly again on a similar line these are the obvious ones so, so you know you, you go to a council you you ask them for help you give them reasons to believe you might be homeless because you're sofa surfing and effectively they don't treat you as a homeless person they say oh you know you can stay there for a bit longer you know come back to us when they kick you out or whatever um, and actually or, or they might even say you know you need to bring a letter from those people to say you've been evicted which isn't technically true it's sensible to do it anyway just to play the game but that shouldn't be that should not be kind of in, uh, insisted on in that situation but yeah lots of people who are actually homeless um, won't be roofless they might be homeless because they can't afford their rent um, or they can't um, they can't live there safely or whatever they're getting seriously harassed by neighbors and it's really kind of having a detrimental effect on their uh, effect on their life all that kind of stuff again I've done videos on homelessness but lots of people approach the council give them reason to believe they might be homeless through one of these other kind of reasons and the council doesn't pick up on it and that's something you'll definitely see within part six and part seven so lots of people approach the council and the council says in their form why are you approaching us for help and the person says because I can't afford my rent that is reason to believe that they might be homeless that means that that person should be dealt with under part seven inquiry is taken out it might be that the result of the inquiries is that they can afford their home or whatever but that should continue until they are satisfied that they're not homeless and this affects people massively just to me to jump ahead a little bit in my own thinking this affects people massively because they might be sat in band D or band 4 on the housing register when they're actually homeless, when the council should have picked up on the fact that they can't afford their rent or they're suffering domestic abuse and they should have been treated as a homeless person. But as I say, housing officers in that sense might not know it's going on, uh, but the reality is that the council system itself is very poor, has been badly designed and is easy to challenge. So we've had a lot of success in Bedford by raising these kind of issues in the housing committee and getting the council to improve its system so it picks up on, on people in those situations. So to give you another example of this, I worked with a lady, oh, in fact my colleague, uh, former colleague John, he worked with a lady who had um, stage three cancer. 
she was undergoing chemotherapy, I'm not sure of the details, and she lived in a first floor flat up some very steep stairs and was basically couldn't manage the stairs. So she was having to get paramedics to come and stretch her out of the property to get chemotherapy sessions in the, in the hospital or whatever. And she told the council this in the, in the part six housing register application on the council's website and they hadn't picked up on the fact that she was homeless or that she might be homeless. And again, John got involved, got it sorted out. She got housed in the bungalow not, not long afterwards, maybe a couple of months afterwards, and she got a few hundred pounds compensation for being left in that situation. So again, the housing officers weren't acting out of malice in that. They just hadn't got a competent system that actually dealt with things properly. And as again, just to say, you, you, you don't have to resign yourself to the way that it is. You just challenge the council system on that publicly and get things changed. Other kind of things that, that come up, again, the kind of standard ones, non-priority decisions. So, you know, I've, I've even heard of cases, not, I haven't seen them myself, but I've heard of cases where a pregnant woman's gone to the council and the council said, oh, you know, you're not, you're not 16 weeks pregnant or you're not 24 weeks pregnant, you know, there's nothing we need to do. I heard secondhand that in Northampton a few years back, uh, a pregnant lady that happened to her basically and she then miscarried whilst whilst rough sleeping so obviously can result in some very serious uh, results but that's the kind of that's the that's one of the ways that you kind of see it where there's an automatic characteristic that would uh, that would lead them to be in priority need and the council just misapply it and then they leave them homeless and it becomes even more problematic around vulnerability so if you look in the Welsh homelessness code of guidance it's not called that it's called something else but the statutory guidance for homelessness in Wales it makes the point that people rough sleeping for any length of time are likely to be vulnerable because of their social and, and kind of wider health issues that, that kind of accompany it. And the Welsh law, as far as I know, uses the same case law to define vulnerability. There are a couple of minor differences elsewhere, but that's the way it should be. So in one sense, the Welsh code can acknowledge that actually people who are rough sleeping are likely to be vulnerable. It should be plainly obvious to anyone who is dealing with this, this group of people who are rough sleeping that if they've been rough sleeping for any length of time, they are likely to have associated vulnerabilities that go with it, which is why they are rough sleeping. That's kind of the point of the test in the first place. Now you have this kind of verification process where certainly naive councils, they will they'll have a street outreach team and they'll have their own housing officers embedded in those teams. And if someone comes to them saying, I'm rough sleeping, rather than accepting a homeless application, which they should do, rather than placing them in interim accommodation because there's reason to believe they might be homeless, might be eligible, might be in priority needs, they are instead told to go back and rough sleep and they're told that there's someone will then come and verify them and find them and, and go through that process. That's unlawful, that's gatekeeping. And lots of voluntary sector charity workers don't know that they're actually part of this or they're complicit in this this um, institutional gatekeeping, this systematic gatekeeping, where the policies themselves are unlawful. Now, sensible councils, or cynical councils, you might say, where councils will pay voluntary sector organisations like charities lots of money to run their, their rough sleeper outreach service. And so what the council then is doing is basically putting a barrier between their own duties and that homeless person. So if the homeless person goes to a charity worker, that charity worker doesn't have any duties to house them. Whereas if they'd gone to a council, they would do, you know, or almost certainly would do in, in the case of someone rough sleeping. So again, verification is it's often lauded as being good practice. You know, I see homeless link kind of putting stuff up on their on their website about how to do it, and they don't there doesn't seem to be a lot of mention of, of how that sh how that fits in with the law. And I've heard lots of stories where people are told to go and rough sleep when they're very, very unwell, or they're told to go and rough sleep and the verification team never actually find them. Um, so both of those issues are obviously not the way the law is meant to happen and is another kind of way in which um, gatekeeping happens. Now, I've forgotten what number we're up to now. I've got 10 on my notes anyway, so we'll see how we get. And I think I've, I've got a bit um, mixed up with a few of them, but that's okay. Yeah, so part six, part seven, going back to that, the part six definitions around local connection and, and employment and things like that are much stricter than the part seven definition and anyone who's owed the main housing duty under part seven gets something called reasonable preference on the housing register which means they have to go onto the housing register so you could go to a council in london and you don't have local connection under part six because you haven't lived there for 10 years but then if you're homeless you should go through the part seven route and you might have local connection under part seven if you've only lived there for six out of the last 12 months or you've got a family member living there who's kind of close anything like that so what happens is you might get bounced away from the part six application process but you should be dealt with as a homeless person under part seven 
and therefore you kind of get back onto the housing register. I'm not going to say through the back door because that's that's the way this is supposed to work. But basically, you go, you go, you you have a much um, more relaxed kind of criteria applied to you. So yeah, lots of people think that they can't apply to a council because they've been told you've got no local connection, whereas actually they haven't been dealt with a homeless person at all. Which again, that's gatekeeping. They haven't engaged with Section 184 when they should have. Other little things that you might see. So insisting that people make a homeless application using the duty to refer form. Uh, unless you are under the duty to refer, so unless you're a probation officer or uh, A&E department or whatever, you know, those kind of organisations that are under that duty, don't touch that form in my opinion, that would be my advice. When a council tells me to fill in the duty to refer form, I just don't, I just ignore them and I send an email to the housing team which says this is a homeless application because the duty to refer form gives the council a reason to believe they might be homeless but it doesn't ask for help, so it doesn't trigger section 184. Now there's some legal debate about that, um, but anyway, that's the way things are working at the moment. And if you read the small print on most duty to refer forms, it even says this isn't a homeless application. So as I say, you'll have you'll have housing officers who are just obstinate and they say we not we won't we won't talk to this person unless you've done a duty to refer. You just need to complain about it because they won't make that argument again once you've got that complaint upheld and it can't not be upheld because it's very clear in the law you can do it any way you want. They won't. They'll stop making an argument. Um, certainly, when you're involved, anyway. It, it, often they'll keep doing it with other people. They think they get away with it, but that's another issue. So, insisting people fill in a particular form, not lawful gatekeeping. Insisting people uh, attend in person. So again, I remember one of the guys I helped a long time ago. He was getting released from prison, and it wasn't from Bedford Prison. So it was some prison somewhere else. Basically, he was. He'd been released in the morning. It was a Friday, Friday afternoon, or whatever. By this, this stage, and he wasn't in Bedford yet but I'd made a homeless application via email to get the process started, to get things lined up for him. He then got kind of tied up with a few things. He was trying to find someone he could stay with that night, so it kind of took him longer to get uh, to kind of get down to the council. And the housing options manager basically said, we're not accepting it. Unless, unless we see him in person, we're not going to accept this homeless application. And as a lay person, I can't go to a judge about that that day. All I can do is I can complain and basically get the complaint upheld so they don't make the argument again and again with Bedford once we've got the argument upheld they didn't make the argument again so when you're uh, when you're supporting people who are homeless when you come up against something which is unlawful your only option if you want to do a good job is to complain about it you need to you need to show them that you're willing to take things further um, and actually get a good response for your client otherwise they'll just push you over basically the way the work the, the way the sector works is those who make complaints and challenge councils are the ones who homeless people want to go to that's that's how it works you know one of the weird things about bedford is over the years of working with just us, a number of people who worked in the homelessness sector became homeless themselves or their loved ones became homeless and they sent people to us rather than their own organisation because they knew we had the teeth, we had the ability to get that person treated lawfully and get housed quickly. So as I say, if you're a professional, you're wa in my opinion, you're wasting your time unless you're willing to complain. And the fact that your funding might be at risk or whatever, I would say that's not an issue which is your problem um, or certainly not an issue which should stop you doing something right but I appreciate uh, that's a controversial subject that's one of the reasons we're having this uh, this event called the ethics of gatekeeping where we'll explore stuff like that so if you're watching this a few months down the line you'll be on the channel somewhere so check it out um, and finally so we'll call it number 10 I don't know what number we're up to I think it's 10 so um, you've also got policies or housing allocation policies which are discriminatory without meaning to be and this can come through in a number of ways there was a recent case with Adur Council I think I'm saying that right it's ADUR it's down near Worthing and Brighton and around there and basically they had a policy where um, if you hadn't lived in the area for the last two years you couldn't get onto the housing register I think that's how it works something like two years and basically what that meant is that um, victims of domestic abuse who'd fled there from another area whereas for all intents and purposes they were barred from getting housed or they would certainly take a lot longer to get housed than someone who was from the area. Now because domestic abuse is a gendered issue because it's predominantly females who are victim of domestic abuse it becomes a, an Equality Act issue as in it's, it becomes an issue of um, discrimination on the basis of sex and so the whole policy was found to be unlawful and I don't think our council is in any way alone in that I think there's a lot of councils that operate similar things as I say it can often be done through the best of intentions so there was a, I think there was Birmingham policy that was challenged because and if I remember this correctly they would only give houses to um, families and what that meant was if you were disabled 
you were limited in what you could bid for so you, you know, some people would not be able to get housed i think that's the essence of it anyway so as i say that the kind of the the idea of the policy was good you know kids need a garden to play around in and all the rest of it that's all good but what they didn't realize is that 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 then led other people to being um, kind of left out for longer than they would otherwise be I don't know if there's actually gatekeeping technically, I've probably strayed a little bit too far, but certainly the, the um the unlawful policy in ADA was was effectively gatekeeping. They were preventing people from, from getting housed or putting people off from getting housed in certain circumstances. So I think that's everything. I'm hoping that will make sense. I've covered a lot of ground very quickly. I don't think I have anything else to say on this at the moment. But yeah, hopefully that's helpful. If you've got any questions about it, as always, stick them in the comments and do check out this event. Um, I'll put the link in the um in the in the Kind of description so it's an event but i think but it's on youtube live so if you're a subscriber you'll get a notification for it anyway but i think that's going to be a really good opportunity just to say out loud that this stuff's not lawful because unfortunately there's this kind of institutional silence in the sector about it so if i've already mentioned homeless link once if you go on homeless links website there's some really great resources on there but if you google like gatekeeping and um, homeless link there's actually very few references to it so you know there's a lot of emphasis for example on trauma-informed care in my opinion unless you are challenging gatekeeping and recognizing gatekeeping because many people find that's one of the worst things about being homeless is how they're treated by their council with disbelief and rudeness and all the rest of it and just prevent it from being helped unless you're willing to acknowledge that stuff you ain't a trauma-informed service you know you've got to acknowledge that actually lots of people who are end up in this situation will have been failed deliberately by the system and we need to just be very frank about the fact and acknowledge that fact so that people can begin to move on. And, and, and as, as an aside, showing people that you're willing to challenge um, bad councils and bad council officers is a really good way to show them that you're trustworthy and, and to kind of develop that engagement and develop rapport with them.